Talib Kwali, uh, so good to see you. And uh, thank you so much for being on my show. I know this is a really uh, kind of a difficult, painful uh, time right now in our country. And uh, yes. I, I just I, I, I just like to uh, talk to a familiar face and a familiar voice. So no uh, thank you for having you? me. It's my honor, my pleasure to be a part of it, part of this. Good to see you, uh, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I miss you. I always get excited when I see you because do you remember me when we first met? I, I do. First time we met was uh, in the reggae taxi, I think, in, or the airport of Amsterdam with, with, with Justin Timberlake and Cameron Diaz. <laughs> we were in the disco taxi. That's right. Yeah. And we went to, we went to Africa together. Uh, we, we, were, uh, we were kind of forced to be friends. We were roommates for <laughs> the whole time. Right. We, we were, were tent mates. Yeah. I learned a lot about white people living with you, Jimmy, in a tent. <laughs> Oh no! Can you say it on the show, or you can't? Um, I learned that white people, and I'm generalizing here. <laughs> you know, but I learned that white people play a lot of poker and drink a lot of whiskey. At least the white <laughs> people I was around. So, <laughs> I think I did a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to get into uh, this with you if, if I can, because I, I really respect your opinion on everything. And uh, what, 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 why does this time feel different, or does it? Um, this is interesting. Um. Reparations for African Americans is a, is a is sort of a polarizing issue, but when, during the Civil War, there was a general, uh, Tecumseh, I feel like was his name, he did Special Orders Number 15, where he said, if you uh, fight with the Union or support the Union and release your slaves, you get, uh, slaves get 40 acres and a mule. Um, now, Spike Lee named his film company after 40 Acres and a Mule. We never got that. Andrew Johnson reversed that back in the days. But it was one of those moments in history where they needed Black people so much and they needed Black people to participate in the country so much that they were making promises to us of 40 Acres and a Mule. Now we have a situation where young people of color, young marginalized people have been trapped in the house because of the COVID lockdown. People have been, haven't been able to celebrate birthdays with their friends. People haven't been able to graduate with their friends. And then you have the perfect storm of, of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd being murdered by police or by, by white supremacists who think they are police. And so you have this energy of people who have been trapped inside the house and they need to release. And so we have this perfect storm of this sort of riot energy. The last time we saw a police uh, precinct burned down was in 1968, Dr. King was murdered. Um, now, six days of rioting, they passed the Civil Rights Act after that. So the riot, like Dr. King said, a riot is the language of the unheard. When people, when voices are unheard, they rise up in the streets. And so now, now that the violence and, and the rioting in the streets is start, starting to like dissipate a little bit, we gotta look at what are the policies and changes that come out of this? What can we vote into being? What can activists, whether they believe in voting or not, contribute to the situation. And I think talking about police reconstruction, re police reconstruction, defunding the police, the police have, have, have received 220% more funds in the last 30 years. Um, you know, talking about reparations, now is the time because I think the country is in a place to hear us now. You've been, uh, uh, through your career, very outspoken about racism and uh, police brutality. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you would mind Maybe tell me one of your earliest memories of, of racism. Wow. Um, you know, I grew up in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, I remember being called the N-word by a little Italian kid that was on my soccer team. Like, uh, you know, his, he was a cool kid on the team. His name was Nick. And we had a race. And I, he was like, I was like, if I could beat him in the race, I could be one of the cool kids, right? So he said, sure. let's race. So we raced. And soon we finished the race, I beat him. And I was like, ha ha, I won. He was like, of course you won. You're a n You know, so that was, I, had, I knew the word was bad. That's the first time I heard it. But the feeling of feeling cool and feeling like a winner and feeling like I was one of the cool kids immediately was deflated with one word. And I didn't respond to that situation because I was like seven, eight years old. I didn't know how to quite respond, but it stayed with me. And I vowed that I would never let no white person call me that word without any consequence or pushback ever again. This is stuff that I've never spoken to a therapist about. This stuff that I've never uh, spoken to my parents about. But black people have to, not have to, but we've internalized this trauma and this normalization of racism that when it, when it, when it bubbles up to the surface, People are like, oh, how how you doing? How you dealing with it? So sorry. It's like, yeah, like, yo, I've been dealing with this whole my whole life. I've been black my whole life. There's nothing new. Yeah, 
do you think with Twitter that it's uh, it's magnified because people are feel safer that they're anonymous and that they're behind their keyboards and they don't you have to see their face and be upfront? Yeah, I, a lot of people are critical of my amount of Twitter engagement. You know, I, I'm on Twitter a lot. And so me as a, I consider myself a pro-black person. My pro-black is means that I combat bigoted ideals. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't go for individuals. If you say something that punches down to marginalized people, if you say something that's hateful or bigoted and it comes across my radar, I was taught that I can't ignore it. Some people have to ignore it for self-care, but my self-care is always speaking out. And how about, uh, is that, is that spilled over onto your, your kids? Oh man, I, man, Amani, shout out to Amani and Diani. You know, my kids are wonderful. I love them so much. When, um, when Trayvon Martin was murdered by George Zimmerman, I went to have a meeting with Harry Belafonte and a bunch of other uh, uh, people who could amplify activist voices. And Harry Belafonte put me in touch with the Dream Defenders. Um, they were occupying the state capitol in Tallahassee to sort of try to reform and change stand your ground laws. And so when Trayvon was murdered, my son was 17 years old. And I took my son down to Florida. We occupied the building with the Dream Defenders. It was it, That was me and my son's first, like, excuse me, activism together. Now I've been stuck in California. I follow my daughter, Diani Ashe on Instagram. Shout out to Diani. She, I'm following her and she's out there protesting in the street with the people in Brooklyn in the neighborhood where my bookstore and Kiro Books used to be. So it hits close to home. I see my daughter out there with these people and I get worried. I get scared. I'm like, yo, you out there, it's a pandemic going on. You could get hurt. You could get killed. Anything could happen. But then I'm like, I'm proud of her at the same time. She's my daughter. She's doing exactly what I would have been doing at that age. So I, I gotta just like let it be. She's the new. She's the new me. I gotta let her. I gotta let her have that. Yeah. Is it tough watching the news, particularly for Black people? There's two. There's two uh, sort of trains of thought. One is we shouldn't be retweeting and showing traumatic black images. It's like how white people used to lynch black people and have these picnics and parties and just watch black death. So I get that people are, tra are traumatized by it and don't want to see the images. But the flip side is without us seeing those seven minutes of that cop, Chauvin, I think his name is, kneeling on George Floyd, we would not, they, he, he would not be arrested. If some people can't deal with it, I get that. But us seeing it moves the dial forward. Yeah, and it's a tough job for the, the those the, uh, journalists and reporters on the on the field as well. Yeah, Especially. I mean, you know, we're in an era. Look, Donald Trump is trying to be a dictator. Donald Trump might not be. He might not think he's a fascist, but he's moving in fascist ways. When he talks about uh, uh, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. It's illegal to shoot someone for taking your property, especially if you're a cop paid by ta tax dollars to protect the people. So when he says that. Black people who are rioting are thugs. And he says the, 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 the press is the enemy of the people. They feel empowered to shoot thugs. They feel empowered to shoot at the press because the press is enemy of the people. A black CNN, I watched a black CNN dude get arrested on live TV. This is insane. When the police are targeting the press, we don't have a democracy or republic, whatever you want to call it. We have fascism. We have a dictatorship. Is there hope? Is there yeah, I mean, it's got to be. I'm an artist. I, I, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, you know, but you have to follow the lead of the people who are doing the work. Don't engage in erasure of the people who are talking about this when, when the cameras are off. When the cameras are not focused on George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery, there are organizations on the ground doing the work. There's, um, there's the Movement for Black Lives. Their website is uh, m4bl.org. There's in Minneapolis, there's Black Visions MN. BlackVisionsMN.org. There's Reclaim the Block Org in Minneapolis. Um, you know, there's a, a new one I was reading. Uh, shout out to Alicia Garza from Black Lives Matter. She works with an organization called Black to the Future, which have laid out a 27-page Black agenda that I completely agree with. And I think that the things that are in that Black agenda are good for the whole country. You know, the Black agenda is not something that just helps Black people. The black agenda is something that helps the marginalized, the poor, the people who are, are, are the fuel to the fire that creates America. Uh, I always love having you on, man. I really, really appreciate you taking the time and talking to me. And uh, again, as I said right before we started, I miss your voice. And uh, <laughs> I do, you miss you too, do you have anything new coming out that we, uh, well, I know we're not here to plug anything, but. 
Right. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I got a new album with Diamond D. Shout out to legendary hip-hop producer Diamond D that I'm working on. But in the spirit of what we're talking about, a lot of people have been hitting me up and say, we need that Black Star album. We need that Black Star album. Me and Most Def are in the final stages of the Black Star album. It's produced completely by Mad Lib. So shout out to Mad Lib and everybody at Oxnard. But the new Black Star album is dealing with a lot of this subject matter. And I'm working hard. Trust me when I tell you, I'm working hard to get it out to the people. Uh, I love you, man. I can't wait to see you. Hopefully, next time love in person. Too, okay. No doubt. Let's let's Stay get safe. it. Bye, Peace. buddy. Thank Peace. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh-huh. on and on and on. Uh, I said. And it's on and on and on.